I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, because I know tis true. It satisfies my longings, as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Cortana, Alexa, and Siri, who are they? <laughs> Computer voices. You can ask them questions if Cortana is a Windows product. So if you have a Windows computer, you just speak to your computer and say, Hey, Cortana, what's the capital of Mexico? Hey, Cortana, what's the temperature outside? You know, just ask questions and you get this information. If you have an iPhone, you ask Siri. Alexa is an Amazon product. If you have an Amazon Echo or Dot in your home, you're just in your living room and you want to know something, you just ask the question and you get a verbal answer back. Things have changed, haven't they? Yeah. Just a few years ago, we used to say, just Google it. Google it. Go on the internet, go to Google, and then type in whatever you wanted to know, and voila, here are a million answers to your questions. You see any issues with that? In general, there's really no depth to it, is there? You get a wide variety of things. I mean, you can dig in and keep going and going and going, but we're not inclined to do that. If we ask Cortana, who is Jesus Christ? Now, there's a good question. What might Cortana tell me? A Jewish teacher, religious leader, and some believe to be the Messiah of the Jewish faith. What they often do is they'll give you a Wikipedia response. And if you go to the first two sentences in Wikipedia about Jesus, that's what it would be. That's the kind of answer you get. Now, if you're satisfied with that and you stop there, how good is the information that you're getting? Not of much value, is it? So if we ask Cortana any question, we'll get an answer. But we don't go very far. The same kind of thing was true with calculators. But when calculators came out, then many students said, you know, why do we have to learn how to do all these, this mathematical manipulation? And calculators can do all kinds of problems, not just basic arithmetic. But why do I have to learn how to do all these things? I can just take the calculator and punch the things in. I'll get the answer, and that's all I need. The problem, I, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to tell a story anyway. <laughs> Back years ago, I was working with a young person, and she was making a presentation to someone, and she was to calculate the cost of something. And anybody with any sense about what she was talking about would know that a reasonable number would be something like $7. So she pulled out her little calculator, $673.82. Didn't blink an eye. She was convinced it wasn't $7, it was $673. Now the person to whom she was speaking had common sense and knew that that was a ridiculous answer. And he challenged her and she started to get in his face because she was convinced that what she saw here, this is how you get the answer to a mathematical question. You punch these little buttons and the answer comes up. Well, that's what happens with Cortana and Siri and Alexa also, isn't it? The way that we find out something is we ask this question and we get the answer. And that is the answer. Now, it may not be the right answer. It may be wrong. Or it's so shallow that it doesn't really tell you what you need to know about that particular question, but you're satisfied with what you have, and so you stop. The issue today is about knowing God. Simple little topic that we're going to talk about knowing God today. So what does it mean to know someone? You know who they are. You know who they are. Facts about them. All right, so you know some facts about them. So I have a face and a name. When you're new someplace, that's a challenge all of its own, isn't it? Just to get faces and names to match up. 
I mean, that's not really knowing them, is it? I can look around and I know all the names and all the faces, but does that mean I know anybody? It really doesn't, does it? So I have to have some information, don't I? And so if I know some facts about that individual, I know a little bit more about them, but I may not still know them. I may be able to match names and faces here, know the occupations or former occupations, all the hobbies of everybody in here, and still not know you, not know anybody. If you knew my name and my face and you could match those up instantly, and you knew what I had done in my life for employment purposes to earn money, you know what I do now that I'm retired, you know that information, do you think that you know me? Not many people would say that's knowing somebody. It has to get deeper, doesn't it? For a while, when you were growing up, your family knew you, didn't they? I mean, they really knew you. (laughs) But then over time, as you move away from them, you start another life and you start growing apart from them, how well does that old family know you now? kind of fades away, doesn't it? To know somebody, to feel like you know somebody, you really need to have some personal information, intimate information about that person where you really get inside and you have that relationship with one another. So there's a relationship involved, not just a bunch of facts. It's not something that Siri or Cortana can answer, not just a bit of information, but it has to start getting into some personal relationship to really feel that you know somebody. And that takes time, doesn't it? What keeps you from knowing me perfectly? You don't interact with you on a regular basis. Don't interact with me on a regular basis? Too high on track. Yes, I'm not going to let you know everything about me. And you're not going to let me know everything about you, are you? There are some things that we have that we're just not going to share. Maybe after a long, long, long time, we may open up some things that we have kept inside for a long time. The other problem is that do I really know myself perfectly? God knows you perfectly. Do you know yourself as well as God knows you? So getting perfect knowledge of another individual, I don't think that's going to happen. But how can we get to know that other person better? How do we go about knowing somebody better? Ask questions. Ask questions. Ask Ask the spouse. That usually will get you some better information, yes more truthful and more detailed. Watch his actions. Actions, yes, to see how people behave. But it's going to take some real effort on your part and on their part, isn't it? I mean, this is not something that happens instantaneously. I can't decide I'm going to get to know Gabe and say that that's going to be done by the end of the afternoon. It's not going to happen. He's not going to let me in that easily. It's going to take some time. It's going to take developing that relationship with one another so that we're comfortable in sharing heartfelt information with one another. And that's not going to be done quickly and easily. So what does it mean to know God? Because we're talking about knowing God today. So what in the world does that mean, to know God? You have to know what He thinks and what He has said and what He put forth for us. So it's going, to be a, it's going to be a lot like knowing that other person, isn't it? It's going to be having a relationship with him so that there is that depth of knowledge about one another, but it has to be more than just knowing about them. It has to be the relationship so that I know them. To know him, we have to think about what it means to know him. And it's just have that relationship to understand who he is. Because just as we have to understand if we're going to know another person, we have to understand who that person is, get into the feelings of that person, the thoughts of that person, the actions of that person. And the same is going to have to be true of God, isn't it? We're going to have to have that relationship so that we have some understanding, some grasp of who he is, what he thinks, how he thinks, how he acts, and particularly how he's going to interact with me. All right, so that's to know him. So how am I going to know him better? So we have various things. This is a beginning point, isn't it? I mean, he has given us a revelation of himself, hasn't he, in his word. In the Bible, God has given you a revelation of himself. Here is what I want you to know about me. It would be a lot easier for me to know Bob if Bob gave me a book and said, all right, here's everything you need to know about me. You want to give me that book, Bob? It hasn't been written yet. 
But he's given us that, hasn't he? So we have a great opportunity right here, don't we? To get to know him better by knowing this book. How else can we know him better? Spend time with him. Spend time with him. We're going to have to take that time with him just like we would another person. The best way for us to do that and communicate with him is through prayer, isn't it? But see, most of us, when we pray, we're more interested in telling God what he needs to be doing. Here's a list. You want to get on these right away. I have them listed in priority order. And how much listening do we do? We're not very good at the listening. We're not even good listening to one another. But listening to him, most of us do struggle with that. We don't really listen to him very carefully. But we're going to have to do that, aren't we? How else can we know him better? Practice his teaching. All right, so we're into action now, aren't we? And, and when you look at the way that everything is going, I mean, everything develops around you. Does he have anything to do with any of it? Oh, yeah, his hand is there, isn't it? So are we looking for that? Are we looking for God's hand in what's taking place around you? Are we looking for what he wants me to do in this situation? Or are we trying to line up the situation with our political views or with our other views on something else? and just trying to manipulate the situation to satisfy ourselves. What's going on? The actions, the situations, the circumstances. We need to see his presence, his direction, and what he wants me to do. David got angry with God on occasion, didn't he? Does that mean that we should get angry with God? Why would somebody get angry at God? And I want to tie this to knowing God now. Selfish motives. Selfish motives. He's not doing it the way I told him to. Disagreeing with the result. Not disagreeing with the result. This is not developing the way that I think that it should. He's messing up. Isn't that what we're saying when we do that? When we get angry at him? If we are angry with God, we don't know him well enough to know how much he cares about us. How much he loves us. We've forgotten what he did for us. He loves us so much that Jesus died on the cross for us. And now we're mad at him because he didn't work this out the way that we thought that he should. If we are angry with him, we're saying to ourselves and to those around us, we really don't know him quite as well as we should. Because we're saying he didn't get it right. He always gets it right. So why would a Christian fall away? Not only do we get angry, but then we walk away from him. Probably everybody has thought about it or done it perhaps to some extent at some point in their lives. Why do we do that? Wine, wine. Want some cheese with that? <laughs> wine, wine, wine. But we do that, don't we? We're not satisfied with the way that he's working things out. Do we know him as well as we should if we have that attitude? I mean, you only walk toward him. You should never walk away from him. Walking away from him is pretty dangerous business. We should only be running toward him no matter what the circumstances. But if we are walking away from him, it's, it's just like when we're getting angry with him. We're proving to ourselves and to those around us that we don't know him as well as we should. We don't know that he is the creator of this universe. He is a providential God who is in control of everything. And he has made promises to us and we can trust him to keep his promises. But when we do this, we don't trust him anymore. And if you don't trust him, you don't know him. Because if you're going to know him, if you're going to truly know him, then this isn't going to happen. And if it does happen, it's just a message to us. It's a reminder to us that we're straying away. We're straying away. We don't know him the way that we should. Unless a child has some catastrophic things or something, sometimes they fall away. They just lose, lose faith. Or if there really is a God. That's exactly right. And to some extent, we have some sympathy for those individuals who've had that catastrophic loss because we struggle with that when we go through it doesn't mean we don't struggle. I mean, it's hard. But we have to remember who He is and what He does and our relationship with Him. Because we all have hard times in our lives. And if you haven't had any yet, you're going to have some. I can promise. It's coming. And if you've had a whole bunch of them, you're going to have some more. That's just living. So we're going to have the hard times. We have to remember who he is. We have to know him. We have to work to know him. And we work to know him better by studying his word, by praying continuously and recognizing his hand. 
wherever you are, whatever circumstance you're in, you're there for a purpose. He has put you in a situation, however catastrophic or however pleasant or whatever, but he's put you in that situation for a purpose. What's your purpose in that situation? The movie clip I have for you this morning is Mona Lisa Smile, Julia Roberts, back in 2003. You have this young college professor, played by Julia Roberts, Catherine Watson, who was teaching art on the West Coast, and her dream job was to teach at Wellesley College up in the Northeast. This is in the early 50s. At that time, Wellesley was viewed as one of the most conservative colleges in the United States, all-girls school. But her dream was to teach at Wellesley, and the dream comes true. She gets the job at Wellesley. What you see is the development of progressive ideas planted in young minds that are raised in a conservative environment. And it's a fertile soil because the young minds going to college has been for a long, long time and probably will be for a long, long time and from here, somewhat rebellious as they're, they're growing apart from family, that as they have the opportunity now to be alone, apart, away from family, away from mama and daddy fussing at them over little things, They have that independence that they've been striving for for a long, long time. And so when these ideas come in that promote that and give them ideas that are different from what their parents believe, they kind of jump all over those things and eat them up. And that's what you see in this movie is Catherine Watson comes with these progressive ideas from the West Coast and the students really start getting into it. Anyway, that's the main theme of the movie. In this clip that I have for you, it's two scenes. The first one is her first class at Wellesley. And the second scene is her second class, second day with that same group of students. And what you're going to see is some basic information about knowing. From the beginning, man has always had the impulse to create art. Can anyone tell me what this is? Wounded bison, Altamira, Spain, about 15,000 BC. Joan Brandwin. Very good, Joan. Despite the age of these paintings, they are technically very sophisticated. Because because of the shading and the thickness of the lines as it moves over the hump of the bison. Next slide. This one you are probably less familiar with. It was discovered by archaeologists in 1879. Lascaux, France, dates back to 10,000 BC, singled out because of the flowing lines depicting the movement of the animal. <laughs> Let's go on slide. Seated scribe, Egypt, 2400 BC. Peasant couple plowing, 16th century BC, Egypt. Snake goddess, Minoan, 1600 BC. Victorian art fresco, Minoan, 1600 BC. Funeral mass, Mycenaean, 1200 BC. By a show of hands, only. How many of you have read the entire text? And the suggested supplements. Long way from Oakland State. What is that? You tell me. Carcass by Soutine, 1925. It's not on the syllabus. No, it's not. Is it any good? Hmm? Come on, ladies. There's no wrong answer. There's also no textbook telling you what to think. 
It's not that easy, is it? They knew the book. They knew everything in the book, didn't they? But they still didn't know art. Like a lot of people in the church today who know the Bible, have read the Bible, can tell you all kinds of things about the Bible, but don't know God. So we're going to look at Daniel Nebuchadnezzar, and we're going to talk about knowing God in this little story that you all know. With Daniel Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to start with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon, and the Babylonian Empire was the dominant force throughout the region at this time around 600 B.C. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has led the Babylonians to capture Jerusalem several times and finally ended up destroying Jerusalem and the temple. But in the meantime, they took some young people captive as prisoners, and Daniel and his friends, known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were all taken as captives to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar is the big, powerful king over the mighty empire. Daniel and his friends are captives, young men, captives taken into Babylon to be indoctrinated in the Babylonian culture. So the purpose of of this three years of education is to indoctrinate them into this culture, to immerse them in the Babylonian culture, and to wash away the Jewish culture so that they may serve the king of Babylon, not as Jews, but as just smart people in the Babylonian culture. So their names were changed. Daniel is Belshazzar. We don't remember normally the Jewish names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but those are the Babylonian names. But while they're there, they are committed to remaining faithful to God. And the first example we have of that is with the food, where they decline to take the food and the wine from the king's table and just ask for vegetables to have a special diet so that they don't become or so immersed in that culture that they forget who they are that they are God's people chosen by God. So they remain faithful to him. That's their objective, is to remain faithful to him. Would you do that if you didn't know him? Because if you didn't know somebody, how interested are you in being faithful to them? But if you know somebody, then you are interested in being faithful to that person that you know. And particularly with God. And if you know God, you know who he is, you know that he is the creator, he is in charge, he does control everything, and he wants you to know him, then you're inclined to be faithful to him. Daniel and his friends are going to remain faithful. So after the three years of training, the king brings them in for their oral exams, and they pass with flying colors, and the king then puts them into his service. So this is the situation. You have this mighty king, and he has these young Jewish men in service to him. So now we're ready to get to the story. And what we're going to see is God's going to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar three times. These are pretty strong revelations of himself to Nebuchadnezzar. Stronger probably than any revelation that you have had of God in your life. So we're going to see how Nebuchadnezzar responds to those revelations. Does he get to know God? So the first revelation, he's going to learn that God knows everything. God knows everything because Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and it upsets him, disturbs him. So he calls in all his wise men, his magicians, and says, okay, tell me what the dream is and what it meant. They said, well, no, no, no. You tell us the dream and then we'll tell you what it meant. He said, no, you tell me the dream. You tell me what was in my mind and then you tell me what it means. And they said, nobody can do that. So finally he ends up calling Daniel in. Daniel says, nobody can do that. No man can do that, but I have a God who can. So when Daniel's called in, Daniel says, but as for me, this mystery has been revealed. And Daniel tells him what the dream was and what it meant. Now, this was a prophecy at this point. I'm not expecting Nebuchadnezzar to be interested in God foreknowing because he's not going to have any proof of that. But the fact that God knew what was in Nebuchadnezzar's mind. If you had a dream and Cecil could tell you what that dream was and what it meant, would you be impressed? You have not told anybody about your dream. Would you be impressed? Notice what Daniel says. Daniel says, the mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have. God knew, God revealed it to me not because of who I am or how special I am, but he wanted you to know. So here's the message to Nebuchadnezzar. God knew the dream. God revealed it to the one who was going to share it with him. 
And now Nebuchadnezzar knows that God can understand even the dreams of a man, the mind of a man. Are you impressed about this God? Are you going to be inclined to want to know this God? Nebuchadnezzar's impressed, but he fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel. He says, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. He's impressive. I'm impressed, but it's Daniel's God. Nebuchadnezzar paid homage to Daniel, not to God. Didn't worship God. Didn't seek to know him. Didn't want to know more about him. He said, man, that's impressive. Daniel, you are really good. Daniel had already told him it wasn't him. Second lesson. God has the power to rescue. He has the power to do anything that He wants. You weren't impressed enough to know that He can know your mind. He has the power also to do whatever He chooses to do. He has the power to rescue. And you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar constructing this image 90 feet tall. Gold image, 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. Huge thing. He's built this image and now He requires everybody to fall down and worship it whenever they hear music. So when he called all the people around, he says, okay, now when you hear the music, you all have to bow down and worship this image. And we know the story. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there and they didn't bow down and they didn't worship. And so the other wise men of Nebuchadnezzar's court go running to him and say, wait a minute, they weren't worshiping. So Nebuchadnezzar calls these young men in, says, okay, I'm mad, but you can make it right. If you'll just bow down and worship this image, you'll be okay and we'll go on. And that's when they say, not going to happen. We'll not do it. Our God is able to rescue us. We believe that He will, but if He doesn't, that's all right too. Even if He doesn't, then we're still not going to worship another God and we're not going to bow down to Him. Now, can you do that? What is the threat? What happens if they don't do it? Fiery furnace, death, throw, I'm going to have you thrown in to this furnace and have you burned alive. So are you ready to bow down? Are you ready to bow down? What if somebody held a knife to your throat and said, I'm going to behead you unless you deny Jesus Christ and that you say something else is God? Does that happen today? Yes, every day. That's the situation that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were in. Bow down and worship this other God or you're dead. They knew God and were faithful and stood strong. We're not going to do it no matter what. God may rescue us. He may not rescue us. We will not worship another God. So Nebuchadnezzar has the furnace heated up seven times normal, has them thrown into the furnace, and lo and behold, they don't die. They're out there. They've been bound, and now they're walking around, and there's a fourth man in there. And what does he say? He's impressed when they're brought out and not harmed. And he says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He doesn't say, I want to worship that God. He doesn't say, I want to know that God. He still says, Daniel's God was great. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is great. That is amazing stuff that he can do. He can rescue people. He has great power and he can do tremendous things. Isn't he wonderful? But I'm not going to worship him. I am not going to try to know him. So he goes on. Time passes and he needs another lesson. So God's going to give him another lesson. Now that's pretty patient of God, isn't it? He's been pretty patient with us as well if we really think about it. He's going to give him a lesson. God knows all that's coming down the road. So he's going to give him a prophecy that he would live to see fulfilled. God's going to tell him this is going to happen and then you will see the fulfillment of it. God foreknows. All three things together, you might think would be enough to convince a lot of people. But also you'll find that it's not enough to convince Nebuchadnezzar. So he has another dream and he's disturbed by his dream. This time he remembers the dream and he tells his wise men, his magicians, tell tell me what the dream means. They can't tell him. So he finally calls in Daniel. This is chapter four of Daniel. In chapter four of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar is narrating this after the fact. You have Nebuchadnezzar describing what took place after it took place. So Nebuchadnezzar is saying he's had the dream and he's called Daniel in. And look how he says, at last Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belshazzar, the Babylonian name that he had given to him, the name of my God, no matter how strong the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel might be, his God is still the Babylonian God telling this after the events of the story that he's in the process of telling. 
He called in Daniel and still describes Daniel as someone named after my God. So this third one isn't going to work on him either. Daniel tells him what the dream means, that he's going to be wandering out in the fields like a beast for seven periods of time. And then he's going to come to his senses and he'll be restored. So Daniel tells him it's going to happen, but get smart. Practice righteousness. You'll be a righteous man. Don't be the jerk that you've been all these years, but wise up and maybe you'll be able to last a little bit longer and live a decent life a little bit longer. Well, he does for 12 months. After 12 months, he's out walking on the roof of his palace and looks out over the majestic city of Babylon. And the way they describes the city is the city which I have built by my mighty hand for my glory and my honor and my majesty. Very humble man. So even after all that he's been through and after the warning that he's been given by Daniel, he is still filled with pride. We all still have plenty of pride left in us, don't we? And immediately God speaks and he is hit with some insanity and he is sent out into the fields to wander like an animal for seven periods of time, likely seven years. After the time passes, he came to his senses and we start off pretty well. He says, I lifted my eyes to heaven. All of a sudden his senses are restored. He's back to being sane. I lifted my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him. Praised God, honored God, doesn't say he worshipped him. Can you know God without worshipping God? You cannot know God without worshipping him. If you truly know him, you're going to worship him. No worship. But he honors him. This guy's all right. You know, Jesus is a great teacher. Heard that? Don't believe in him, but they think he's a great teacher. Same kind of thing. Man, that's wonderful stuff that God I mean, he's powerful. But the next thing he says, at the time my reason turned to me, so when, when I came back to my senses, I not only did this honoring God thing, but for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. Right back to the pride. As soon as my senses returned, my majesty, my splendor returned to me to take over my kingdom. Amazing. Did he know God? He turns around and says, you know, I praise, I extol, I honor the king of heaven. I don't worship him. I don't believe that he's the only one. My God is felt. You see, you can have a lot of knowledge about God, even some powerful experiences about God, and still not know him. Knowing him requires more. You know, the last few chapters of Daniel are prophecy for the end times. Powerful stuff. Daniel says in chapter 11, the people who know their God in those hard times will stand firm and take action. The people who know God, even when the times are hard, are going to be faithful. They are going to stand firm, faithful to him, in spite of all those troubles. And they're going to act. They're going to do what I've called them to do in that situation. Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't do those things. Daniel and his three friends all did that. They stood firm and they took action. God wants you to know him. God wants everybody to know him. That's his desire. We do that through his word, through prayer, and through events, the things that happen around you, through the blooming where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. Remember the price he paid so that we might know him. Jesus going to the cross and dying for us that we might know him. That's powerful. And to ignore that, ignore him, is to not know him. So to be angry with him is to not know him because we're saying that he didn't get it right. We know better and we don't. Or to fall away from him, the same problem. We're going in the wrong direction. If we fall away from him, we're going away from him. In the times of trouble, we need to get closer to him. We need to know him better. And so we need to be focused on him and him alone. I love to tell the story. T'will be my theme in glory. To tell the old, old story. 
of Jesus and his love.